thanks very much for uh, allowing me to come and talk to you about uh, this particular topic. Um, I'd like to talk to you this morning about web-based module delivery for an engineering graduate school. I'm Kevin McCarthy from the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering here in UCC, and my co-author is Ava Adam. And Ava is the e-learning expert and e-learning go-to person for a graduate school that's based here in UCC with a rather nice title. It's called the International Center for Graduate Education in Micro and Nano Engineering. And more of that anon. Okay, briefly what I'm going to mention, and Betty has told me to be really quick, so I'll try to do that. I'll introduce briefly what is this nice titled graduate school called the ICGE. I'll particularly focus in on a module that I'm involved with myself, which is to do with radio frequency design. And I'd just like to give you some experience and to share some observations of what I've, what I've seen about that module in the last year. And finally, I'll hopefully uh, finish up with one or two conclusions. So what is this thing called ICGEE? Well, it's a graduate school that, as I said, is based here in UCC, or it's um, the lead partners in UCC, in the Tyndall National Institute, in fact. It's called the International Center for Graduate Education in Micro and Nano Engineering. It's a graduate school that's funded by IRCSET. It's a virtual school. In, in other words, there are many partners. It doesn't have a building as such. It's distributed and the students who are involved with it have all agreed to be part of a structured PhD program. There are many members around Ireland. We have some international partners as well, but I've just um, listed the Irish members here. You can see virtually everybody in a way is involved. And we use this virtual learning environment for course provision. In a way, we're a guinea pig to a certain extent. IRCSET didn't fund too many graduate schools when they started in this game a few years ago, so ICGE is one of the first of its type. We chose to use Moodle as our method of delivering courses online. Why Moodle? Well, a very simple answer, it's open source and it's free, and so therefore there's no argument about licenses and paying for it, and everybody can get at it. When a student logs on to the ICGE site, they see this picture here in front of them. And really what you see here, or what the student sees, is a list of technical modules that they can access material for, depending on whether they've signed up for that particular module. They can access an archive section which has recordings of seminars and workshops organized by ICGE, and then they can access a kind of a bulletin board and shared area. Just to mention briefly the module that I'm involved with, it's called EE4011, that's the UCC code. It's a module which is on radio frequency integrated circuit design. It's normally provided as a fourth year module to our electrical engineering students. It's an optional module in fourth year. Over the last number of years, it has also been made available to PhD and master students here in microelectronics who need a taught component of their postgraduate work and who haven't undertaken the module already in part of their studies. So in a way, I was already ready to go, if you like, to try and put this material online. In UCC, it's delivered as 36 lectures spread over TP1 and TP2, mainly around PowerPoint presentations. And now I'm offering it to the off-site online ICGE students through the virtual learning environment, through Moodle. Now the approach I have taken is rather than recording live class lectures, I actually sit in front of uh, my own PC and record myself using a piece of software called Camtasia and of course PowerPoint and various webcams. So that can be pretty exciting. <laughs> so when one of the students clicks on my particular course, E4011, on the virtual learning environment. They see a picture like this. And here you see a picture of me in front of one of the statues outside the Boole Library. So they see that on the left. On the right, they see then the list of options that are available to them in this module. And just looking a little more deeply at that list of options that's available to them, this is just scrolling down that web, web page a little bit. There's about 30 lectures in all available to them for this module online. And for each of these lectures, they can see a short summary of what the lecture contains. 
they can actually watch a video of me talking my way through that lecture, and they can download a PDF of the, of the presentation I talked through. Now, hopefully this will work. I don't mean to scare you or to bore you to death. I will probably end up doing both. But I'm going to attempt to play a one-minute ex excerpt from a typical web-recorded lecture, just so that you see what the students would see when they decide to click on the video. I've been told that this works. I'm not actually sure, but here we go. Ah, oh, crap. Right. Does this mean it has to be installed? Okay, try again. Betty, I'm taking this out in my 10 minutes. Okay, so that's just a picture of what they see. And now I struggle trying to get rid of this. Uh, okay, let's see. Stop. Escape. <laughs> Can we make this go away? <laughs> <laughs> the, the trouble with live presentations. Yeah, that's a good one, isn't it? Ah, oh, great. Okay, thanks, Ava. Okay, so. There is approximately 30 hours of me moving that yellow dot around the screen of my computer. <laughs> so the students can watch about 30 hours of that carry on if they want to. Now, what was the main issue I encountered with that last year? Well, the main issue was actually one of a practical, finding the time to sit in front of a PC and record myself for 30 hours. I had the great initial thought that I would record these type of lectures to keep in sync with my classroom lectures. In other words, I would do about two hours of recording per week. That was blown out of the water by the second week. So actually, it was probably March by the time I had recorded the equivalent of all the TP1 material, and it was April by the time I'd recorded the equivalent of all the TP2 material. Bearing in mind that the poor online student would be facing an exam in May, this was an impressive feat on both our parts to make that exam. But we did it anyway. So, as I said, finding time to do that was quite daunting. And in fact, for every hour of recording that I did, it took about an hour of processing to put those little annotations on it to say what material, what section of the lecture contained what material. But more importantly, in, in our case, we ended up with a lot of synchronization issues between the video, in other words, my lips moving, and the voice. There was a lack of sync after the recording. And that took a lot of post-processing to move little clips of the audio over and back with respect to the video to try and improve that sync. We tried various things to help that, like take, uh, changing the display on the monitor, changing different webcams, going to low definition, etc., etc. But still, it was troublesome. And it caused a lot of work for my uh, co-presenter, Ava. Now, the funny thing about it, all that was done, and we had only one off-site student. But anyway, that's, that's life. And that student actually succeeded in sitting the exam. Now, an important part of this is the student had to fit in with the normal exam regime in UCC. That is, even though the material was delivered online, the student still came to UCC and sat the exam with the rest of the students. That in itself was an exciting event because the exam was in City Hall and it was the day Queen Elizabeth II visited Cork. <laughs> so I didn't even know if the student would get into the City Hall, but he did, which was, another, which was great. 
There was 24 on-site students taking the course. I gave access to all of them to the VLE. 11 signed up and about seven really used it. If we look at how the students used the VLE during the year, bearing in mind that most of the material was developed quite late, there was eight students really ended up using or visiting the site. I've called them A to H. There's a lot of squares on this slide. The squares represent every individual lecture on the VLE. If the square, oh, you can't see it at the bottom, but if the square is colored red, that means the student opened up the PDF presentation. If the square is colored blue, the student opened up the video. I've no idea how much of the video they watched, but at least they opened it up. You can see there's a particular student there that has the highest usage. That's the offline student. And that student opened up all the PDFs and opened up half the videos. I subsequently query how come he only opened up half the videos and he said, well, if you gave them to me in April and you wanted me to do an exam in May, you didn't give me a lot of time to open them up, so I had to work with the PDFs. So I kind of accepted that as being reasonable. You can see the other students then are more jumping in and out of it, some more than others. Very quickly, I know it's a small number of students, but I still wanted to know what they thought of the whole idea. And we used SurveyMonkey to do a little survey of those students. As I said, there was about eight of them actively participated. Five of the students responded. Many of the survey questions were generic UCC questions, but some of them were targeted at the VLE itself. And I just want to share the responses of the ones that were targeted at the VLE. So I asked the students, would they agree with the statement that the quality of the published multimedia content, audio and video, is satisfactory? And OK, it's a small sample. There's only five students. But they all agreed with that, thank God. So 80% of them strongly agreed and 20% mildly agreed. Percentages are very easy to calculate on the fly when you've only five students. So that's a good thing. Anyway, they all agreed, so that was a good thing. Now, I asked, did they agree that the content was easy to navigate and the course items easy to locate? And again, they all agreed, maybe not quite so strongly, you have 40% there in the mildly agree category. Now, those questions seem kind of dumb and they seem kind of obvious. But on the other hand, if you're going to go to the trouble of putting material on a website, the material sh should be reasonably clear and it should be accessible in terms of being able to navigate around it. So again, the answers to those questions have at least indicated to me that the basic functionality of the material is okay. I then asked them, do you think that any modification is required to improve the delivery by distance learning? And in that case, um, one student or 20% said, yes, the modification is necessary. And if we look at the answers then to the more open um, type questions, we see what that modification is. One of the students, despite 30 hours of that yellow dot moving around the screen, actually suggested I put more lectures <laughs> online. So that's kind of interesting. And that student also asked for some work through exam papers um, on the site. Some more general comments then um, that's applicable both to online and in-class students, they all tended to ask for more design examples and some more tutorials. Just, I'll give you a very brief look. You can look there at the feedback from one student. No, no um, prizes for guessing that this is the online student. And in general, this quote illustrates that the student had a good time. The quote also illustrates something that students always tend to tell me, and I never seem to uh, quite judge rightly, is that there's a nice comment in there saying, I did, however, find that the sheer volume of the content was daunting. But anyway, um, that's interesting in itself. OK, so uh, Betty has just waved at me, so I'd like to summarize. Um, I hope I've given you, although a very brief introduction, I've given you a small introduction to the ICGE, and I'll say it once again, it's the International Center for Graduate Education in micro and nano engineering. And it's a graduate school with multiple partners around the country, but hosted here are, um, with UCC and in particular Tyndall National Institute as the lead partner. I discussed the experience I had with putting one module, an RFIC design module, onto that VLE. And I had small usage of the VLE last year, but actually, notwithstanding the fact that the usage was small, I regard the usage and the feedback as promising. 
So now we're trying to roll that out for this academic year. We're already a bit on the late side, but anyway, we're still rolling it out. And one of the comments that could be made about the previous incarnation is that it was a little one-way traffic. And I would like to build in some ideas for increasing the interaction with the students for the next rollout of this module through the VLE. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. And I'm sure those uh, lectures are just as entertaining as this one. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, would anyone like to make a quick comment? Yeah. Let me just say thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. In terms of this, is it? Um, well, believe, I guess there was a, a number of years ago, maybe three years ago, Erkset had a call for graduate schools, and then it was a reply, it was a proposal in reply to that call. Um, I guess the latest, the most recent round of graduate schools that would be cropping up around UCC, at least collaborative ones, would be in response to the PRTLI call. So there was a PL, PRTLI call all last year, and I know there have been a, a few more graduate schools are now kicking in um, as a result of that call. And in fact, um, I'm also involved in one called the Telecommunications Graduate Initiative, TGI. And that will use a slightly different model of delivery. In that delivery, again, it's in multiple colleges, but the delivery will mainly be centered around organizing two or three day lectures on site, where all the students travel to the lecture location and take a workshop for two or three days. I was just wondering what kind of um, you know, the partners and then what kind of funding one should Yeah, well, this now, um, I'm, I wasn't responsible for putting the proposal together. I was a, a kind of a collaborator as opposed to the main. I, as far as I know, this proposal is in of the order of two million euro or something like that, uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Um, most people, given a chance, um, because it was relatively new at the time, the concept of a collaborative graduate school, it was relatively easy to get partners around Ireland who would say, yes, we can contribute. Um, so I think most people, if they see it as a way of getting a little bit of money, they'll say, yeah, that's a great idea. And also because it was new at the time, I think people were willing to have a go at doing something because they wanted to be seen to be involved in a graduate school. Now, the reality is it's actually proven to be a lot harder to roll out than we had anticipated, partly because the problems I had of finding time to develop the material has been replicated in the other partners, and partly because people change as well. You know, you have one person signing up on behalf of a department, and then they may hit retirement age, and you're trying to find the next victim in that department who will take over the, the mantle and deliver the courses. So in practice, I think it would be important in any proposal that you have the buy-in from somebody senior in the department so that it's not an individual lecturer exposing themselves to a big risk. If you can have the individual lecturer volunteering to do the work, but certainly you need some motivation from a higher level. Now, in our case, and actually the one logo I forgot, and I should be killed for it, Engineers Ireland came on board strongly, and they were one of the partners as well. They're not providing any of the courses, but they're providing an overview, and they, they're extremely useful to us in interfacing at a, an administrative level. And they, you know, they've helped to sort out or smooth out some of the issues we've had with IRCSET due to the initial slowness in the rollout of the project. So somebody like that, a high-level body that can, has a, a wide view and has experience of interacting with high-level administration is very helpful in the mix. And I must apologize to them on camera for leaving out their logo out of that. So thank you for reminding me. <laughs>